Shall we stand? I want you to lay hands on, on your own head this morning and just be a little bit selfish. Be even a little bit introspective. You have heard many people say that LFC is a very unusual church, and, and so it is. It's an unusual group of people gathered together in one place for a purpose, for a plan. And I want you to think of your plan, your vision, your destiny, the dream in your heart, the thing that won't go away, maybe the thing you've never told anybody about, but... As Mary treasured in her heart the word that Gabriel spoke, I believe Christians, it says that when Christ ascended, he distributed gifts in all believers. And I want to go maybe where no man has been before in your life and open the door to your future. And Holy Spirit, I pray you will come and be our teacher, be our guide this morning. I pray that you will reveal what has been hidden, that you will release what has been bound, that you will set individuals free, as well as cultures and ethnic groups and congregations. It's a great group of people gathered here. I call out the ministries in this place. I call them forward in the name of Jesus. I call them to the surface. I call them to be seen. I open ears and I open eyes to see and to perceive. Lord, we have closed the doors. We have shut off the past. We have let it go. We have surrendered our own will, our own purposes, our selfishness. We have sanctified our motivations. And today we pray that you would help us move forward to face the task and fulfill the task in Jesus name amen amen praise the Lord praise God I, I thought last week was a very significant word for me I, I, I was a bit shocked to be honest with you I was overwhelmed by the response that I had I did not expect that I had no idea of the pains in so many people's lives, I had no idea of the, the doors that needed closing. Amen? And please be courageous. Don't be fooled by the past. It, it, you can cut it off. You can let it go. Right? Thousands of people have done it before you, and you can do it too. But I, I, I beg you, listen to me. Don't despise this moment, and don't just behave like another Sunday. Because I know when I've got a, a good word. I know when there's something in me. And when Peter was here, I received something. And we're still getting it. We're still getting it. God's still talking. What did he say? Shut the door. Shut off whatever problems or issues have been in your past that you have known in your heart. You have seen a vision of your future. You have this dream. You've had it for years. You've got it inside but you've never known maybe, why not me? Why have I not fulfilled that? I know it's there. And I believe his first counsel to you and to me is shut the door, whatever that is. I don't believe he's going to tolerate anything less than that. Amen. Shut the door. Remember, as I was saying, when we got saved, maybe a thousand times we played games with salvation. We prayed prayers, but we weren't sincere. Remember? And then one day you were sincere. And that's a, that moment, I believe, is what God is bringing us to, calling us to right now. So don't, please don't miss this moment. Do it right now. Shut the door on anything and everything that you know has been a tether, a, a, a bondage to the past, and prepare for today. Amen? Years ago, a university did a study on happiness. What makes people happy? And I thought the findings were quite surprising to me. They came up with three things, three top things that make people happy. Number one, something to do. Number two, someone to love. 
And number three, something to look forward to. Now, that, stu that study surprises me for this reason. Eyes forward. Eyes forward. I would not have put something to do at number one. I would have put someone to love. Amen? <laughs> Come on, romantic men. Put your hand up. <laughs> I would have put someone to love. Now, my first instinct would have been to say that. But you know what? After years working with people and years in ministry, I think, no, someone to love is not actually the first. This, this study is true. It is something to do. You know why? A young person in their teens or in their 20s, oh, I want to fall in love. I want to get married, you know. They might not say it like that, but you know what I mean. <laughs> they want to fall in love. They want to get married. And it becomes a pursuit. They actually silence the voice within in the pursuit of relationships. They silence what is underneath in the pursuit of what they see as essential and maybe even pushed into it, <laughs> right? They silence that, and then they get married, they fall in love, they have their children, they love their children, and then they call the pastor. <laughs> Could you come and visit? Because I'm still missing something. True? Oh, yeah, very true. What's wrong? Well, I'm very happy with my family, very happy with my husband, happy with my children, but there's still something missing. And it's that something to do bit that will not go away. Thank God it won't go away. It shouldn't go away. It should niggle us and niggle us and niggle us until we actually face up to it. A guy called Maslow years ago came up with the triangle, the, 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 the hierarchy of human needs. It's interesting uh, that each of us have needs that drive us, like self-esteem, et cetera, et cetera. And his theory was self-actualization, becoming everything that I'm made to be is actually the pinnacle. Now, I personally agree with that, that study agrees with it. My experience agrees with it. And so it is frustrating for me to know so many people that have a dream. I don't doubt it. They're aware of the door. I don't doubt it. But they still don't get through that door. And I thank God for what he did to me. I really do. Honestly, folks, God did something... I don't know why, I don't know how, but when I got saved, just like you, I repented, I came here, and he taught me quickly how to go through open doors, yeah, he did, many, many doors, and it was almost like easy for me, he graced me with that, and I saw many things happen, and you know, I thought, well, fantastic, what do I do now, kind of thing, help others, go back and help others, to do exactly the same thing. Because so often, what blocks you can be a very small thing. Not something complicated, not something major, but some minor tweak, some minor thing that all these years have been holding me back. I, I bought an apartment in Glasgow, and it's an old building. And when you turn the tap on, there was this enormous bang, 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 bang. Oh, dear. In the wall, they call it hammer. And I called the plumber. I thought, goodness, he comes along, and I've got a stopcock halfway down my wall. So the plumber comes in. I say, listen to this. And he goes, uh-huh, uh-huh. He walks over. He turns the stopcock. He turns it back. And he says, 60 pounds, please. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, what? 60 pounds. He said, that's it. What do you mean that's it? It's just pressure. Oh, tiny tiny little things, insignificant little things that actually make a huge difference. So often that is the case. It's not something we lack. It's not something else we need. It's, it's so often something I'm not obeying or not believing correctly. Years ago, Europe has changed considerably, but years ago when you traveled around Europe, there used to be multiplied border checks. And when you drove up to the border, the guard would stop your car, and they would have the same three questions. Where have you been? Why are you here? And where are you going? Three very good questions. Where have you been? It's important. Why are you here? And where are you going? 
And in terms of vision, those three things are particularly critical, right? I need to ask and assess where I've been in case it's holding me. I need to ask myself, why am I here? And, I mean, above all, really, I need to know where I'm going. I need to have a firm vision. Show me any man of God in Scripture who did anything, they had a vision. True? Oh, yes. They knew where they were going. They knew what it was about. They were on a journey. They saw things. They believed for things that were not. And they achieved those things through faith. It was so clever today. We don't, you know, live that way. See, the church has changed. The process of getting a word and then acting in faith to fulfill that word. These processes, I believe, will never change. They're not going to alter. They're not going to modernize. Some things are stable and eternal. And the word of God is one of them. So, do me a favor. I want you just for one moment to get a picture of your dream in your mind. I don't care if it's a secular type dream, that it's a business or a ministry. <coughs> I don't mind what it is. I want you to form a picture, a mental picture in your mind of what that is. And my first point to you today, that vision is possible in principle. Amen? Just in principle. It is possible. It's not impossible. As you know, I run. I love to run. It's excellent. I enjoy it. And I watched a documentary on Roger Bannister. I'd heard many things about that race that he ran when he broke the four-minute mile. But I have to say, it shocked me when I saw it. You know, I saw the, the video of it. It was tremendous. Absolutely astonishing. I mean, he took off. He truly deserves the notoriety for that. It was a, a fantastic achievement. That was 1954 when the first man ever in history broke the four-minute mile. The Romans were determined to do that. I told you. The Romans used to get the runners and have lions... And they released the lions to chase the runners because you're going to run for your life. Ah, wow. That's what they did. They couldn't break that. But, I mean, it's amazing. The, the, the power of the human mind, the strength of that stronghold, I cannot do this. Roger Bannister was an exceptional person. He believed that it was possible for him to break that. That was 1954. Up to today, 20,000 people have done the same thing. Once we realize that something is possible in principle, it loses its power. It loses the ability to say, well, you can't. Oh, no, well, actually, it is possible. Remember I shared on camp last year, teleportation is possible. I mean, that just blows my mind. It's possible in principle. This pulpit here, it appears solid. It's not solid. The whole thing's held together by, by vibration, right? And if you get the frequency right, everything's held together by the power of God's word, which is voice, which is universe, one word. The whole thing is scriptural. But this thing can be deconstructed in a second. And they've actually, in principle now, understood that they can deconstruct and reconstruct. Goodness. I mean, it blows my mind. Amen? It's astonishing. It's possible in principle. Now, your vision is probably a lot less complicated than deconstructing this pulpit. Amen? A lot less complicated. And we do overcomplicate the, you know, the view of our, of, of our future. We humanize it. We take God out of it. And that's maybe why some of us are stuck. So point one, very simple. The vision that you have within your heart for your life is possible in principle. Point number two. It's possible for me personally. That's me. That's you. And you need to believe that. That whatever God has given me, whatever's on my heart, I can achieve this. I can do this. Eyes forward, please. Stay with me. I, I, I talk to you from personal experience. I, I, think, I don't know if I told you this before. This is partly embarrassing. <laughs> I was going to Ireland, and I was on the boat. I had to get a house, blah, 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 somewhere to live. And I walked into this crescent of a street and I had the number, had the number of the house and I was going to be living in this house for a couple of years, you know. So I walked into the street and you've got all these houses up and up at the top there's a beautiful house. 
And I know one of these houses is the one I'm going to be living in. As soon as I saw that house, my flesh said to me, it's not that one. <laughs> You're not going to be living. It'll be one of the others. That's too good for me. Yeah. Been there, done that. Don't be like that. I'm just telling you the truth. I was a Catholic. My religious nature felt you're not worthy. As soon as I thought that thought, I took that thought, and I, 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 I reject that. I should not have thought that. I still thought it. <laughs> I started to walk up. Guess which house it was? It was that house. Good lesson, Lord, right? But something within me felt that I'm not worthy of this. And when God speaks a word, it can be so incredible. You are Peter, and on this rock, I will... Not me, Lord. I'm not worthy of that. He shows you something. It can be something outrageous. And you just can't believe it. You can't see. You just don't feel worthy. Now, there's a sense in which humility, of course, is critical. And there's a sense in which an awareness of our own worthiness is permanent. But you must not let that be debilitating. Amen. Because no one is worthy. Right? No one is worthy. So get that thought out of your head that, and, and certainly don't let it hold you back. I mean, I've, I've, I've had to overcome this a, a feeling of unworthiness in order to achieve, in order to, you know, break through in the kingdom, to overcome it again and again and again and again. And some people never overcome it. They, they sabotage their own success. This is what they do. Self-sabotage. You try to help, they won't receive help. Debilitating themselves. I remember when, before I got married, I was just about to ask my wife to marry me. And I remember thinking at that time, you guys didn't meet her, but I'll say this. <laughs> that woman was head over heels, mad, crazy, insanely in love with me. I don't have the superlatives. Don't look at me like that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have the superlatives. I don't have the superlatives to say it. And one day, I remember, before I asked her to marry me, I was out for a walk, and here's this whole unworthiness thing, sneaky little thing. Yeah, many people pull out of relationships, you know. Many people don't follow through. And God opens doors, and they can't see it. They can't believe it. But I had to deal with something in myself, or I'm not going to be happy. So I went for a walk one day, and I said, you know, am I worthy of this? And I, I came back with a conclusion, no, but who cares? <laughs> no, but who, I mean, who, who cares? Who is anyway? Nobody's worthy. So just get on with life and enjoy it, right? Don't get stuck in those things. I, as a young believer, a new believer, I, I believed, I saw the word of God going around the world, around nations, in simplified form. Now, here I am. I've had no secular education. I've got no biblical education. I know nothing. And I'm sitting in a church. I'm over here. I've just repented, but I can see a big door. Anybody been there? Anybody been there? I can see a big door. I believe for huge things. So I've got to get this unworthiness thing out of my system and get a biblical perspective. Nobody's worthy, right? And anyway, f get the focus on God. Let me ask you another question about that vision that you see, that dream that you want to fulfill, that you know is yours, that's maybe buried inside you. Answer these questions for me. Your vision, has anybody else ever achieved something similar? The answer is yes. Say yes. Did they have more or less than you, ability, money, opportunity. Did they have more or less? Answer, both. There were people who achieved the vision that you have, your dream. There were people who achieved that who had nothing. And there's people who have achieved it who have had everything. It's like millionaires, you know. You hear their stories. Some of them came from nothing. Some of them were given, like Trump, 200 million. Well, you know, right? So different genesis for, for, for different people. But nonetheless, you can still achieve it. Have other people done it? Yes. They have done it. Were they less or more? They were both. And obvious concluding question, why not you? Right? Why not you? Why not me? 
Why not you? Why not pursue that? Why not fulfill it? It's technically possible. It's possible in principle. It's possible for me personally. So what is holding me back? And often it is a lack of faith. Whether you like it or not, you are the manifestation of your faith today. That's what you are. If I look at your life and I analyze your life, your life is as you, have, as you believe, so you've received. Your life is the manifestation, the physical appearance to us of your faith level. Matthew chapter 2, verse 5, it says when Jesus came into town, he saw their faith. You can see faith. You can also see unbelief. You can see faith by what people do. You can see faith by, you know, the changes they make, the things they reach for, that they are believers, believing. But you can also see unbelief. And unbelief shrinks back. Unbelief doesn't believe. Unbelief gives in to a multitude of things. And it's not just feeling unworthy, which is a natural human trait in some senses. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. As I speak with people, because this subject bugs me, I, I, I love to see people set free. But as you talk to people, you say, well, I can see that God's called you. I can see that there's a vision. And they'll talk about their vision, you know. I say, well, why have you not pursued that? Why have you not done that? And somebody will say, well, I've got a good job, you know. <laughs> My company look after me really well, really kind. I've been with them 10 years now. I got a good situation. I got a pension, workplace pension, right? I would pursue my vision, but actually, these are the things that stop me, and maybe you don't even realize it. And you have to, maybe for the first time in some people's lives, just deconstruct that. <laughs> uh, you just said somebody's looking after you really well. Your company's look, what? You can't look after yourself, is it? Because that's what you just said. You just said somebody's looking after you, and that's what you're relying on. What is your vision of yourself? What's your perspective of yourself? God can look after you. You can look after you, right? Amen? So get that faith level up. And many people will talk about pension, especially after 40, 50, or whatever. I'm staying in my work because I've got a pension plan and this, that, and the other. But, I mean, I can say the same thing, friends. My question to you is, okay... When do you get your last pension payment? What's the last day? The day you die. So, I mean, hello, Christian. Isn't your eternal reward start then? Aren't you supposed to be working on everything after that? You've actually done everything. You're following your employer, not following your voice. You've got a pension which is in this world which finishes when you die, which is when you're going for your eternal reward. Are you getting it? Do you understand? You've actually got that entire thing backwards. Now, you may sound incredibly wise to people, but you do not sound wise if you read the book. No, sir. You can look after yourself, you, being through God, I mean. Once you've got that word, the word will give you confidence. That's what's missing. I tell you, so often, that's what's missing. It's hearing from him and then moving forward with that God-given confidence. So number one, your vision is possible in principle. Amen. Amen. Your vision is possible for you personally. Amen. And number three, you're going to have to be incredibly creative. And the good news is God is a creator, right? He's a creator God. And don't forget that. Let that creativity burst out of you, move out of you. You've got it. It's just releasing it. I titled this message very carefully. We could have said achieving your dream, chasing your dream, pursuing your dream. I said releasing your dream. Because everybody, I believe, has got something inside them. Worship team, preachers, pastors, listen to me. LAW people, listen to me. You have to be creative. Get in the zone of creativity. Get into that place and minister out of that. You've got two choices. You can have performance or creation. Two choices. The world has performance, and we're supposed to have an endless supply of creativity. Performance is plastic. 
it's reproduction, it's dead. Creati- you are an original copy, right? There's only one of you. You're made to do something, to be something, to give something, to sing something, to go to somewhere. You are a one of a kind, a one-off, and that is where the creativity comes from. Do not, do not, for anybody's sake, stifle that. I'm telling you, don't stifle it. Have you got any idea the number of people who've been offended with me? <laughs> Thousands of people have been offended with me. They say, well, th- th- this other guy doesn't, that's fine, I'm not him. I have a creativity within me, and I will release that creativity. Now, if you don't like it, sorry, but you're trying to touch on the very source of my vision. Hello? I will not compromise on who I am in God and who he has made me to be. So if that, doesn't, if that doesn't rhyme with you, no problem, but it's not my problem. It's not my problem. I have a job to do, and I will do it. You know, one of the most famous quotes of all history was Henry David Thoreau. Listen to this. If a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it's because he hears a different drum. And you need to be careful who you're trying to keep pace with, who you're trying to please. Have you ever been on the tube and somebody's sitting with their headphones on going, ha, 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 and you don't get it, but he's got it. Or somebody's sitting on the tube, you don't get it, because that thing is living inside that person. You're not hearing it. And don't let anybody switch your machine off, right? Just because they don't get it. I don't need people to get it. I've warned you this many times because I know it's a major issue until you get over that point. The the best worship leaders on this planet are not performance orientated. They are creative. The best singers, the best authors, they're original, they're one of a kind. They know who they are. They found who they are. And then you don't compromise. You compromise because you're performing. Oh, is that that good? Do you want me to do it like this? Ah! (laughs) Who needs it? Who needs it? The world can do it better anyway. Yeah. You think, I mean, just, just, we could be here all day. History is studied with people who found who they were and then in an uncompromising way released it. Not caring what anybody thought. Bob Dylan. Can Bob Dylan sing? I can sing better than Bob Dylan. (laughs) True? The answer is blowing in the wind. 100 million copies. <laughs> it's, it's, it's incredible. Do you know what? When he was singing, people were listening not to a performance. Someone had found their hearts. That's all it is. There's loads of them. Leonard Cohen just died, right? <coughs> I grew up with Leonard Cohen. Not with Leonard Cohen, with the music. It flooded our house. Nearly all the whole family liked him. He's a fantastic artist. But, I mean, please, people, you have to be joking. I don't know if you're familiar, but it's, they call it music to kill yourself by, right? To make fun of him. The average Leonard Cohen line goes something like this. I put the noose around my neck. I climbed up on a chair. You know, it's just, oh, God, no. He's incredibly depressing. But Cohen, to be honest, Cohen was a genius. He was one of a kind. Started as a young man, and he's still singing, producing albums in his 70s. Amen. It's fantastic. So you don't like it? He doesn't care. (laughs) You don't like Bob Dylan? Bob Dylan doesn't care. He doesn't need your approval. Amen. Many of you are doing what you're doing for other people, right? Mistake. Mistake. You can't even get off first base if that's the attitude. I like Nobel Prize winner for literature, W.B. Yeats. Couldn't spell. Yeah, fantastic. Couldn't spell. His whole life he couldn't spell. But he was bursting with creativity. So he used to just write it out, you know, and fix that, you know. (laughs) Yeah, couldn't spell. Fantastic. But didn't let that little thing stop him. Didn't let it stop, you know, don't let anything stop you. Don't let the opinions of people stop you. Dylan doesn't care. But he's not doing what he's doing for them. Are you enjoying this? I don't care. Hallelujah. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Amen. 
I wrote out some things here. Go home and sing in an empty room. You get the picture? If you're a painter, go get into a deep cave where no one will ever go and paint on the wall. Why? I don't need a reason why. It's who I am. It's what I do. And that's the zone. That's that door there. There is a door. There is a vision. Christians are not wrong. But what they do is they, we see performance. We see things and then we try to emulate that. We assimilate to the churches. We come in on fire. We come in with a dream. We come in with a vision. And so quickly it is lost. It is tampered with. It, it's ruined. Don't do it. Don't do it. Not just worldly artists who found themselves, but Christians. Francis of Assisi, unique, used to talk to the birds, <laughs> preach to all these animals. You know, open up in Genesis chapter 3, <laughs> and off he goes. And he didn't care what people thought. John Wesley was famous for riding horseback all around this country, right? And what did he do? He was preaching to nobody. And he did it for years. He wrote about it. He didn't care. I don't do what I do for others. I do what I do because it's who I am. And you need to get that so it becomes... Did you see X Factor a few years ago when James Arthur won? There you had... A spectacular performance. Nothing wrong with it from his opponent. Better singer, better technically, better in every way, probably. But then you had James Arthur, who just, from his soul, from his heart, lets it, re and it's a boat, you know. Right? That's the part of you I want you to find. And you've got to find that, and then I promise you, you need to fight for it because the world comes after you. The church comes after you. Pastor Simeon was praying when Peter finished <coughs> a few weeks back, and he was praying for your future. And I had a vision when he was praying for you. Listen carefully to me now. I had a vision for you. I saw maybe your stumbling block, or at least some of you. As he was praying for going through those open doors, closing off the past, I saw some of you looking to the future with great excitement, and you saw like a massive wide highway. So secure, so I can dance on this highway. And God said, uh uh, sh sh stop that. And he showed me like the sea and stepping stones. Faith. Every step requires new faith. New faith. You with me? And when you get that vision for the future, it can be like a one day, one. no, 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 no. This door is a walk of faith. It's day by day. It's every day with Christ. It's ongoing. So don't get a, you know, idealistic or oversimplistic perspective on achieving vision, even in the first step. It's a step of faith. Faith. And that faith will be, uh, will have to continue into faithfulness. Fourth point, never give up. So once you've got that vision from God, you've shut off the past, you've closed the door, you've turned and you're facing your future, now never give up. <coughs> Excuse me. I gave you the example of the Chinese bamboo tree there. You've probably heard that, but it is a phenomenon, isn't it? They, when you plant a Chinese bamboo tree, you put it down in the ground, and then you have to water that thing, for five years, and nothing appears but, uh, above the surface. There's no sign, nothing. Five years, you have to water it. It's, it's, it needs that, because it's putting down huge roots. And in the fifth year, the thing shoots up above the surface and grows 90 feet in five weeks. A whoosh. So don't be concerned about the years that you have held this thing. I've been dreaming about this. That's okay. And you look foolish. You look stupid. Can you imagine planting a Chinese thing in your garden? For five, and your neighbors are watching? You know, how, you know, how's it going? Oh, it's fine. There's no plant there. No, there is. You haven't got a vision. Yes, I do. A 
Other people can't see it. Other people can't hear it. And you need to find that voice and then be ruthless, and I mean it, to the fulfillment of whatever that is God has given me to do. You've got to do that in a non-religious way. Now let me say something here which is important for all of you for the way forward in terms of accountability. Scripture always talks about two by two, right? Not one, not, you know, lone rangers. Two by two. Now, just out of interest, let me see a show of hands in this place. If you have a dream, I don't care if it's a business, a career, anything whatsoever, ministry. If you have a dream in your heart, you're up already. Praise the Lord. Put your hand up. Okay, praise the Lord. Excellent. That's what I thought. Don't answer this question. Who's your mentor? Just think about that a minute. God doesn't do lone rangers. It's not there. You're not going to find it. It's not in scripture. They always have the mentor. Now let me say, your mentor is not a pastor normally. When I got saved, and this is what I mean about my early years, God definitely graced me for a purpose, for an end. Uh, I got saved. I was in a very good church with an excellent pastor. But that pastor was limited. He's a great guy. But I've got this dream that the word of God is going to be simplified and go all over the world. And I look at him and think, nah, because he's never done that. How can he help me if he's never done that? But there was a guy who I knew who had done that. And I asked permission, I'm just going to go and you know, be part of this other guy's ministry. But I'm still under your counsel. Listen to me. Accountability in the church, very important. To your pastors, for your life for your home, for everything, in the church. It's important. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about vision. And for that, you need a mentor. You need a mentor. You need someone who's already done what you see God's calling you to do. Are you with me? You have to find that person. It's a person. You have to find that person. I've had several. Peter's one of them. He's not the only one. I've had several over the years. But my first one was when I was under my pastor. I knew I had a vision. I'm going to be involved in the word of God. That's what I'm going to do. But you, sir, can't help me. I respect you and I submit to you and everything, not this. So give me permission. I'm going to this other guy, which is exactly what I did. And for three years, that guy mentored me, taught me, instructed me, and that helped me grow. And then you just got over the stepping stones. So some of you are stuck at the pastor phase. You're stuck at that level. You know what Jesus said one day? He said, my peace I give you. Remember? Whose peace? His peace. If you haven't got it, you can't give it. My peace I give you. And if someone has not achieved the thing, the vision that I see, how can they help me? They can't help me. So you need to think good accountability here. Make yourself accountable in a church, of course, for all things in life. But for vision... <coughs> excuse me you're going to have to find someone and you know I, I know what you're going to say I don't know anybody pray about it I've never had a problem with this at all never had a problem with receiving mentors God is giving them to me at the right moment the right person comes along who's already done what I want to do what I know I need to do and they disciple me in that specific Janet was praying in here on Wednesday I think it was about dream thieves and I, I don't have time today to talk about it, but there are dream thieves. There are, you know, ah, yo, I don't let them bother me. I tell you the truth, I don't let it bother me. Wrong time, I don't let it bother me. I don't care. But as soon as you articulate, I mean, read scripture. As soon as you articulate a dream. What happened to Joseph as soon as he said a dream? <laughs> right? As soon as, he, as soon as he says it, they're out to kill him. As soon as the wise men come, what happens? Herod wants to kill, right? And anybody, anywhere in scripture where you see this voice, you also get attacked. So you have to be kind of prepared for that. Um, basically, folks, sorry to break the bad news, <laughs> but there are people, Christians, on this planet whose sole ambition is to take your dream. Their, their goal is to wake up each day and think, Hmm. <laughs> it's just life. They, they come, you really shouldn't do that. Or they'll find a way. Some of them are lovely. Some of them are absolute deep. 
come in all shapes and sizes, forms, all forms of reasoning. Some will be super sweet. Some will try and tempt you out of it. Some will try and talk you out of it because they haven't done it. Some will attack you. But for multiplied ways, these dream thieves, as you termed it, these dream thieves do come. And you must be prepared. I've taught on vision and all that kind of things in many countries. And, you know, you do a day like this or you talk like this and someone will come up and say, I got it. 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 You know, oh, that's fantastic. I'm going to go at it. I'm going to go. And you come back two years later. It's still, still in there. <laughs> what happened? Say, what happened? I remember you. They think you forget, you know. I remember you. You said you were going to do A, B, B, B. And invariably, it's the same problem. Oh, yeah, after you left, I, I, I spoke to Uncle, Uncle Jack. Oh, what was it? He said, you can't do it. Yeah. He said he tried that, and it didn't work. <laughs> and he said this, and he said, do you know what? Aye, aye, aye. You have a choice. We all have a choice. Who are you going to listen to? What voice are you going to obey? And the more you listen to them, the more they'll talk to you. The more you take it in and the less you're going to fulfill that dream. I have a zero tolerance policy for anything to do with where I feel God is taking me. Because I know if I sacrifice anything of this, that's not good. You have to be completely sold out. Shut the door. You have to be completely sold out. And then these things are relatively easy. The biggest battle is within, being polite to those who oppose as much as possible, and then just going full on, full throttle for it. Look at the creativity in this room. It's all around us. People with immense capabilities that are never you know, released, never known. God, help us and forgive us help us reach the goals to which he's definitely calling us in these days. Gifts, whether it's business, whether it's ministry, whether it's missions, whatever it is, follow the biblical pr same principles, same principles. With the Ethiopians there, I was preaching on Matthew 20, you know, the laborers in the vineyard. I can't seem to get myself out of that parable because it's today. You know the story. Jesus went out at the ninth hour, twelfth hour, third hour. And the wonderful thing, so glad that's in scripture. He says, I went back out at the eleventh hour to tell people off. No. To say, what are you doing? Where have you been? Why are you here? Where are you going? Just ask them, what are you doing? And in Matthew 20, it says they were idle. He found them, I, I mean idle, for me it's not, they're probably very busy people, it's this thing. They're not pursuing this. What are you doing? Why have you stopped that? Listen to every voice except God, I tell you something, that's what people do. Listen to people, they listen to everything except him. Yeah, mistake, mistake. I wasn't wrong about those words. I wasn't wrong. I wasn't wrong. I was right. I heard it. And it's just that resilience to see it through to completion. Number one, it's possible in principle. Correct? Number two, it's possible for you. You have to personalize it. This is possible for me. Number three, I've got to be creative, not performance oriented. I've got to be myself. Hallelujah. You know, sorry, I, I always gravitate back to marriage as examples. Why do I do that? <laughs> but this is a very good example. Well, I know what it was. It was a singles night when we were here. I was advising them about acting. If you're with a person uh, and you're dating them and you're acting, it's the wrong person. Because it won't last. You can act for six months. You might even get an Oscar. You might make it to a year, but I promise you this, when you get married, you will not be acting. The acting will stop very fast, and you will think, who is this, right? The acting will stop, and it's the same thing with your calling. When you are being yourself, 
it's, scripture talks about freedom, right? Liberty, freedom in the Holy Ghost. That's what you need to aim for. Fine. Drop the performance. And like a butterfly, emerge and become yourself. Amen? Stand with me. I invite the worship team to take their place. Maybe, Simeon, could you lead us for a little moment in reflection and in prayer? <coughs> Just stay focused. Stay focused. Think of yourself. I just This is, a, in ways, a selfish day, if you know what I mean. I want you to think of your own internal dream, your own plan, your own thing that God has put within you, and don't be afraid of it. And people may have laughed at you, and then you just hide it, like the, the one talent. Say, I'm not going to say that again. But don't do that. Let God shine his light and unearth everything in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let's go ahead and continue to pray and just reflect. Think about what the Lord has spoken, what you have heard today. In the name of Jesus. 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 As you continue to ask the Lord, help.